Well, hello and welcome back. Our review topic tonight are the two fundamental theorems of calculus. So let's get right to it, and hopefully you have these two memorized, but stick them in your notebook anyway. The first fundamental theorem of calculus says if you integrate a to b of little f of x dx, and take notation that this is a lowercase f, you get, well, you can't get the same function when you integrate, so we have to call it something different. So we call it big F. Big F of B minus big F of A. And again, it's upper minus lower. Your second fundamental is a little different. This time you're taking the derivative of an integral. So you notice I have the derivative here from 0 to x. And let's make one little note here that this upper bound has to be our variable. And notice I'm integrating the function f of t dt. These letters between my upper bound and what I'm integrating must be different. Okay, so I just want to make a note again. The letters must be different. And when I do the second fundamental, I'm really doing two things. I'm taking that upper bound and substituting it in. And you make any notes that you need to and I'm taking the derivative of the upper bound. In this case, the derivative is 1, so I could technically put times 1. Okay, so again, if you're, you're not familiar or need a little reminder, you substitute and take the derivative of the upper bound. All right, so let's dive into our first example. The integral from a to b of f prime of t dt. Okay, so just talk yourself through it. If you integrate f prime, who should you be getting? Well, hopefully you're saying f. And, you know, just think backwards, the derivative of f is f prime, so if you integrate f prime, you should get f. And it's just upper minus lower, so f of b minus f of a. Now, I'm just going to rewrite one of these. Basically, I'm going to take this f of a, and I just want you to add it to both sides. So if I add f of a here and add f of a here, I'm going to get f of a plus the integral from a to b whoops, of f prime of t. All right, that got a little sloppy. Sorry about that. Is equal to f of b. All right, now, it's still the first fundamental theorem. I basically, like I said, I just took this value and added it over. Now, you'll notice this is what the setup looks like when you have an initial condition. This initial condition goes out front, and you'll notice this value and this value are the same. This is the initial bound. And what you want goes on top. So every time you do one of those initial condition problems, you are actually doing the first fundamental theorem. So let's try some examples. Uh, this is from 2002, um, our exam AB number three. An object moves along the x-axis with initial position given. Okay, so box that in. That's telling you you're going to use that first fundamental theorem of calculus. The velocity of the object for t is greater than 0 is given here. Uh, this was part d to the example. What is the position at time t equals 4? All right, so my key calc term is position. If I'm given velocity and I want position, I'm going to integrate, but I'm going to start with the initial position first. So hopefully you're saying 2 plus the integral from 0 to 4 of v of t dt. All right, so let me just say it again. The initial condition came first, so that's my 2, plus the 2 goes with when time is 0, so 0 to what I want of v of t dt. And of course, this is just some calculator jargon, and I'm not really concerned about the answer. I'm more concerned about our setup right now. And that's all I'm looking for. Next example. Uh, dy dx is given with the initial condition, find y of 3. So I just want to stress again, this is that first fundamental theorem of calculus, that initial condition. Now, in this case, I want to set this up two separate ways. First, I'm going to set it up if I was allowed to use my calculator. Okay. And they are just a little tad bit different. If I'm going to use my calculator, bam, I want setup and answer. So I would say, okay, I have to start with my initial condition of negative 1 plus the integral. Now notice you don't just slap 0 on every time. Negative 1 goes with the number 2. 
So from 2 to 3, and I would be integrating that dy dx, 3x squared plus 4x minus 5 dx. And again, if this is calculator, boom, I'm just typing it in. You'll notice, so this is a very simple problem. Um, I could obviously just integrate and go from here as well. So this is one example on how to set it up. Let me show you another example. Now again, this is a little longer. Basically, I would just integrate both sides, dy dx, and I would integrate my 3x squared plus 4x minus 5 dx. And notice, I'm not using bounds at the moment. Okay, so when, who's the derivative of dy dx? Hopefully you're saying y. If I integrate this, I get my x cubed plus 2x squared minus 5x. Because there were no bounds, I would have to add on my plus c. And this time, I would use the initial condition in a different way. I would basically go back and I would substitute 2 into x and negative 1 into y. Not using this yet. So 2 into x and negative 1 into y. Negative 1 equals 2 into x. And I would solve for that plus c. So you can see I just substituted my numbers in, solve for my plus c, and now I rewrite my equation. And my plus c is a negative 7. And now I can evaluate the question, which was to find y of 3. So I can now say y of 3 equals, and go ahead and get this answer, which would be the exact same thing as I would have done previously, but just a second method of solving it. Okay, so you've got two ways to get the same thing. All right, so I'm just looking for a setup. Pause it, set it up. I don't need an answer. Just, like I said, pause it, set it up, see if we have the same setup. So I've got my initial condition of negative 5. Remember, the initial value and initial bound have to match these two uh, from 2 to 1 of this junk here. Now, I just want you to note that those bounds are backwards, so I am going to flip this from 1 to 2 of this junk here. And that's all I'm looking for, just a nice setup of the first fundamental. All right, this is an old exam question. A pizza with a temperature of 95 degrees Celsius is put into a 25 degrees Celsius room when t equals 0. So notice you have an initial condition. When the time is zero, you know this information. The pizza temperature is decreasing at a rate of this junk per minute. Estimate the pizza's temperature when t equals five. If you ever get stuck on these word problems, just remember it's all about the units. If you think units, you shouldn't be able to screw this up. Ask yourself what's given. This junk, and just again, watch the units. It's degrees Celsius per minute. Okay, so R of T, I'm just going to make a note of the units. Degrees Celsius per minute. And what do I want my answer to be about? Well, I'm looking for the temperature at 5. So if you just want temperature, just say, what are you going to do with this? Do you want to use this value, or do you want to integrate it or derive it? Well, hopefully you said you want to integrate that. Whoops. So I'm going to integrate R of T dt, and now I'm going to worry about my bounds. Um, I want the answer at 5, so that goes on the top of my integral. I know at 0, now you know two things. You know the temperature of the pizza, and you know the temperature of the room. Well, is the question about the pizza or the room? Hopefully you're saying the pizza. So you need to start with 95 degrees. Okay, so this 25 degrees Celsius room is really kind of just there to throw you off a little bit. Now, what symbol are you going to put between the two of them? Well, it tells you the pizza's temperature is decreasing. So hopefully you've caught that you want to subtract those two. So initial condition with initial value, what you want, and we're subtracting because of the word decreasing. And again, if you ever get stuck, just think units. All right, while we're at it, we're going to work on some of our sentence structures to make sure we get full credit for this. So basically, I just want you to write a sentence to answer each of the following. H of t is the rate of change of the height of a conical pile of sand measured in feet per hour. What does this integral represent? Okay, so they don't want you 
I'm sorry, they want you to describe your answer. So let's just make a note. Describe your answer. Okay, and the two things they're going to definitely check are your units and your bounds. So let me walk you through the first one and we'll see if, you know, you agree and you can do the next two. So I said the net change, so I want you to underline that as you write that in there. You've got to say the net change and then what you're describing. Well, this is the change in the height of a pile of sand. So I said the net change of the height of a conical pile in feet, so there are my units. Again, I'm describing what I'm going to get. If I had feet per hour, feet per hour, and I integrate that, I should just be getting feet. And then I said during the first five hours. Now I also could have said from t equals zero to t equals five. But since I started at zero, I decided just to say the first five hours. And I know it's hour because it was feet per hour. All right, give me a great sentence for number two, pause it, and see if we can uh, get the same answer. All right, so again, I said the net change, so I'm starting with change, in feet, because I had feet per second, so when I integrate V of T, I should be getting feet along the x-axis, that's just how they described it, from, and this time I was more specific, I said from T equals 3, 2 equals 10, those are my bounds, and those units, 3 to 10, represent seconds in this problem. So hopefully you had the same thing. One more try here. So pause it, try it on your own. So I've got the net change in, um, B of T was bacteria per hour, so I'm getting the net change in the number of bacteria from, in a dish, from T equals two to T equals six hours. So hopefully you're feeling better with those sentences. All right, just a quick rundown of the second fundamental. So in question one, if I'm given big F of X equals this integral, and my question is to take the derivative of big F of X. Okay, so basically I want to take the derivative of an integral. Now, the only thing that's goofy about this one is that it's in the wrong order. Remember, that variable we made a note before has to be on top. So I'm going to rewrite big F of X. and say that is equivalent to the negative integral from 3 to x of 1 plus t to the 16th dt. Okay, so that was our first little hiccup. Second hiccup is I just got to take the derivative of this integral. So again, you're just taking the upper bound, substituting it into every t, and then the derivative of the upper bound. So I would say my final answer for f prime of x is equal to negative square root 1 plus x to the 16th. Notice there's no dt anymore, we're in terms of x. All right, consider the function f of x given here. Part a, this is an old free response question, approximate the values uh, for which f has a local min or maximum value. So if I want to find a min or max in calculus, Okay, it's similar to optimization. Min and max, hopefully you recognize by now, is saying take the derivative and set it equal to 0. So I'm going to take the derivative of big F using the second fundamental. So I would get big F prime of x is equal to the sine of x minus the ln of x and set that equal to 0. Now, typically the easiest way to solve these two is basically to take this ln of x and add it to the other side. So I'm saying when the sine of x is equal to the ln of x. So once I've set the two equal, I'm plugging one side into y1, one side into y2, and of course my goal is just to see where they intersect. So I took a quick picture of my screen. Uh, I think the sine curve looks obvious, the ln curve looks obvious here, sine, ln. Find that intersection point, and I've got 2.219. All right, last question here. Um, consider this function, and this is again just part A. Compute f prime of x, and then we'll continue reading. So f prime of x, using the second fundamental derivative of the integral. Notice there's two t's in there, so I'm going to have to put my x in twice. I'm going to get x, absolute value of sine x. Um, so that was my first part. 
And it says, use these intervals on which the graph is increasing and state the intervals on which the graph is decreasing. So I'm setting that derivative equal to zero. Now again, these are typically calculator active. You wouldn't you know, need to solve that necessarily by hand, although it doesn't look too difficult. So I'm gonna grab my calculator. All right, now I'd wanna be clear what we're staring at. Remember, this is a graph of f prime. So in my head, I'm thinking basically I am staring at a sign chart. Okay, so I could draw it or I could say I'm staring at the sign chart. I'm not literally looking for maxes and mins, like I'm not using these values here. I don't care about all these max and min points because it's not the actual function. You're setting this derivative equal to zero. That means you are staring at this line right here and you are determining where you have maxes and mins based off this line at zero. So again, it looks a little deceiving. It's a little blurry to see on my calculator. Um, this does not actually hit zero. This does not actually hit zero. This does not actually hit zero. It does hit zero here but not here, here, or here. So the only point that even is an option for me is this point here, okay, when my derivative equals zero, and you'll notice I went from below the graph to above the graph. So I would say at x equals zero, I have a relative or local min, because f prime changed from positive to negative. Whoops, totally off. f prime changed from negative to positive, which creates a min. Now again, if that had hit zero at any of these other points, I would have these options for other critical points. But if in fact it even did hit zero here, notice you're changing from positive to positive. So it's really nothing whatsoever. And same thing for all these. They're not actually changing signs. The only time I change signs is at x equals zero. Well, that does it for first and second fundamental theorems. Hope you have a better understanding, and I'll see you tomorrow.